anche al padre Pasquale per l'invito cordiale, è sempre bello essere nella mia alma mater, nella mia università di casa, è un tipo di exitus e reditus. <ride> e vedete già che il mio umorismo è già pe peggiorato nell'ambiente accademico. <ride> allora, um, so I'm going to switch into English, um, which is not the language that Sievert wrote in and not my mother tongue, but hopefully it is a little bit more accessible to, to everybody involved. So I apologize for not speaking in Italian this time. Sievert experiences the modern division and dissolution of the history of thought, which begins in the Middle Ages in the heart of the Occidental history of being itself, taking, pl taking place in the movement from Duns Scotus to Hume and the positivist pragmatic concept of being of our age. At the end of the history stands the ontological thesis of the absolute of facts and the concept of a human being for whom the pragmatic technical mastery of these facts has become the medium of revelation of being. Therefore, Sievert wants to go back to the conditions of this fall and repeat the beginnings. At the beginning for him is Thomas, in him thinking has reached its height." End quote. This analysis of Franz Anton Schwarz from the preface of the first volume of Sievert's collected works, whose publication is ongoing, presents us with a vantage point that emphasizes two essential elements of Sievert's philosophy. That number one, he sees in Thomas the most eminent moment of the revelation of being, to use a Heideggerian term, Aquinas having the most profound insight into the mystery of being, and second, that his philosophy, or rather that since Thomas, philosophy um, has been in a continuous decline and suffers from a forgetfulness of being. In today's paper, we want to present Sievert's specific contribution to uh, Thomism's analysis of the ipsum esse, naturally, thinking about the being of God and its relation to the being of creation. Sievert's, Sievert places himself in the school of Thomas and to mystic speculation and ubiquitously cites uh, the angelic doctor in his metaphysical works. He moreover accentuates some features of Thomas's metaphysics, especially those that seem to him most useful in engaging modern and contemporary philosophers such as Hegel and Heidegger. So in this presentation, we want to give a generic introduction, sorry, a general introduction to Sievert's idea of metaphysics in special relation to theology, followed by three specific elements of his Thomistic philosophy of being, namely the elaboration of being as act of being, as subsistence, and participation. These three elements will elucidate how Sievert's, Sievert conceives of the relation of uncreated and cre created being, ipsum esse and esse comune and his creative exegesis of St. Thomas. His specific contribution, I think, consists in understanding ens being not only as really distinct into esse and essentia, but equally distinct into actus and subsistence. So ens structure as actus and subsistence enables Ziver to clarify an individual being's constitution on the one hand with its energetic core of being to use that Fabrian word, as well as its mirror image to the divine being, the, S, the ipsum esse subsistence, that is naturally pure being and pure subsistence. So in the conclusion, then, we will draft um, the historical significance, or at least some points of the historical significance of Sievert's ontological exegesis. Uh, so I'm drawing mostly from the, uh, the first four volumes of Sievert's published works. Um, which have been published, and I'm ignoring the more pedagogical works and the works of the, on the good that have just recently been published by uh, Michael Schulz and Markus Enders. Very good. So these will be the, the parts then. Um, metaphysics, being as act, being as subsistence, and a conclusion. Now, I have to say that there is much to say about uh, Sievert, so I will try to um, explain it well in the brief time that's given to me. So metaphysics and being. Esse est actualitas omnium actum et propter hoc est perfectio omnium perfectionem. This arguably, the sentence arguably presents the core of Thomistic ontology. As such, 
act is shared by uncreated and created being. In the purest and most actual way, it pertains to God as actus purus. In a participated and derivative way, it applies to all creation, created being. As pure and most perfect act, God is the source and cause of all perfection in creation. So with this formula, Thomas Aquinas not only gives us a factual indication, but to quote, a final resolute formulation of the dy dynamic that supports and justifies everything that we call the real with our ordinary language, end quote. Words by Christian Ferrado, which we have heard early in this conference. The framework in which Sievert elaborates the tension between creator and creature is his understanding of metaphysics in general. Sievert conceives of metaphysics, as Aristotle and Thomas did, as first science dealing with first principles, ens et ea que sequuntur ipsum. It is the science that considers reality in quantum primas rerum causas. Theology as science in turn considers substantia separate. Yet there is an overlap of these two sciences. In common being or ens commune, philosophy or better metaphysics touches upon theology since the objective ontological ground is the same in so far as God and creation share elements of being, being here used in an analogical term, not a univocal one. Quote, the science of the ens commune is the science of the esse ipsum, primum universale, as the actual universal cause of a universal effect. This science is understood as theology from comprising the potential projection and Wurf with its source, Ausgang. The ens commune, however, conceptually includes this, in so far as it grasps the terminus of its analogy, substance, in the generality of substantiality, which in turn can be analogically differentiated according to effect and causa. End quote. In other words, theology as dealing with a unified substance, God as cause, opens a vision towards a unified effect of this creator, i.e. creation in its most pure and logical form, its unity or its substantiality. The ens commune describes precisely this unity and is included in the study of metaphysics as subject. It enables the analogical and ontological bridge between philosophy as science of ens commune and theology as science of esse ipsum subsistence. By implicating God as the substance of all substances, metaphysics would calibrate itself anew and now has to reconfigure itself fully according to his insight. Sievert sets out to do part of this recalibration. Quote, thus metaphysics is potentially transphysical from its point of departure as a science of the ens commune and thus, according to its possibility, theology. Metaphysics is with the point of departure directly science of the prima principia with the most excellent reference to the ens commune, end quote. Now, this does not imply that God can be identified with the ens commune, something that Thomas clearly rejects. Rather, Sievert stresses the characteristics of actus and subsistence to show how ipsum esse and esse commune of creation are similiter. Sievert understands this to be fully compatible with the philosophy of Aquinas. With this innovation, Sievert <clears throat> sees metaphysics shielded against two intellectual foes. Number one, metaphysics with a unified object of study is thus shielded against the need for a purely rational univocal concept of being, which Sievert denounces as cause of the rationalization of metaphysics throughout the history of philosophy. And second, against the confused abstraction of a metaphysics that just deals with sensible substances, turning it into a formal ontology. Both of these temptations are somewhat two faces of the same coin, since a metaphysics reduced to the study of sensible substances would necessarily culminate in a, univ in a univocal concept of being as its highest achievement. The formal character of ends and of all of these sequentia ipsum 
must now be subjected to an absolute determination or redetermination in the light of the esse ipsum, especially in, ex in the extent that the first terminus of the ens per se, i.e. substance, must be ordered according to its relation to the supersubstantial and superformal act. So having secured this metaphysical vantage point, let us now consider the different aspects of being, being as act and being as subsistence. Number one, the actus essendi. The actus essendi forms the central core of St. Thomas's philosophy and his philosophy can therefore rightly be called a philosophy of being. Within the Thomistic context of actus essendi exegesis, Sievert lays special emphasis on the act character of created being as mirroring the act character of uncreated being. The act character of both is the primal essence of the image counterpoised by the movement to subsistence also present in both. With a similarity of act and subsistence, Sievert hopes to have established a robust image character relationship between a creature and creator while retaining the pure ontological perfection of the latter, of God, and the ontological deficiency of the former, of creature. Sievert sees a need to establish, not exclusively, the image character on these two facets, since the real distinction is precisely not shared by creator and creature. Being, more precisely the act of being, is the condition of possibility for creation, that is the other. God is that which is most perfectly understood, but nothing can be added to divine being, since nothing is outside of being but nothingness. The highest being cannot therefore be separated by anything other than itself. This divine being, which is in itself subsisting, is in all modes indistinguishable, unbestimmt. It is most perfectly indivisible, and is most perfectly simple. Wherein then consists the similarity of uncreated and created being? Well, the first similarity of uncreated and created being is unity. Since being as pure, simple, indistinguished reality is not divided in itself, it can only be distinguished after the act of creation, the placing of the other, the latter always an ontological dependence of the former. On the former. Since God is one, his creation is one. God and creation cannot, however, be understood as two poles that relate to each other dialectically. In fact, the very concept that outside of God, being with a capital B, there is only nothing, relates to its mirrored image creation, being with a lowercase b, whose being is also only nothing outside of it. So spoken on the level of each individual being then, the only thing that is outside of its act of being is essentia, its limiting or potential counterpart. The latter, however, without the actualization by the act of being remains nothing in and of itself. Essence is limit, it is potency, it lacks ontological persistence and intensity. Sievert in this particular speculation is very careful not to enter into a Hegelian understanding of a dialectical relationship between God and creation or absolute spirit and its dialectical concretization. So act is the most appropriate description of God's being in the Thomistic tradition. The ipsum esse is fundamentally and genetically act. Thomas thus gives us a, quote, final resolutive formulation of the dynamism that supports and grounds everything we call the real with our ordinary language, end quote. Sievert agrees with all attributions of the act of being as a source of perfection of the being that we find in Thomas. The act of being is ground of things, which already contains all perfections. It is indistinguishable in all things. Everything participates in it, but it itself in nothing. It contains the infinite terminus in itself, and therefore primarily bases participation in itself. The act of being is pure positivity. Sievert uses diverse imaginative vocabulary uh, to describe act. First and foremost, I think um, he, most creatively, he calls act fluid. This fluidity does not connote a changeableness or mutability, least it means a kind of processuality. 
fluid means that it is susceptible to take a form, meaning it is determinable by form. More precisely, it is able to be received by an essence. Before its reception by essence, in God's act of creation, the act of being cannot be defined as individual. Were it so, then it would have determination through another or through itself, thereby not being able to truly form one and be determined by essence. The real distinction then would connote two different already determined individual beings, which it does not. In order to be, but not to be this or that, the act character of being denotes its receivability by essence and thereby a certain indetermination. This fluidity changes to individuation in a subsistent being when the act is realized by its form, the form thereby mediating its meaning. This fluidity does not just allow act to be indeterminate before being received by the essence, but also retains a certain proneness to generalization after its individuation. This ultimately allows it to be apprehended and included in the concept of the esse comune or general being. Act as fluid also proceeds from its from and is cause of essence. Proceeds. Having said all this, we have to keep in mind that act is not perfectly definable. As Heinrich Beck pointed out, being as act can be understood, circumscribed, and illustrated, but it cannot be completely encapsulated by concept and by reason, since it is a first principle and in that indefinable. Second, being as subsistence. Next, we come to the movement towards subsistence. In this movement, the act of being, the Entstand, terminates in standing within itself, Selbststand. Within a species of beings, multiplicity is thus generated, since common being, mediated through essence, i.e. its nature, terminates in an individual, which in turn is linked to all other individuals in its nature, classifiable as a species. Furthermore, being, so the act of being, and nothingness are thus both encountered in being itself, im sein selber. Why is that? Because created being is not being in itself, i.e. ipsum esse. This means that in relation to the ipsum esse, it is indeed nothing, an act that is not the pure act, actus purus. And this is the curious character and function of essence within an individual being. The nothingness of essence that is in potency to receive act is the very character of nothingness, which makes room for the act to emanate and assume the essence in the individual. This is the very root of the imago character of man. Since in the Christian view of human nature, man is created in the image and likeness of God, but since God's being, his essay, is not really distinct into essence and being, so as in essence, the image character can therefore not be rooted in this distinction. It is in the emanation of the act that the imago character emerges most prominently. Without Terminating in an individual person, the act would be reduced to a vestigium of being, a trace of God, without a self-standing character, as Siebert allocates in the philosophy of Meister Eckhart. In other words, the likeness of man to God is made possible by the godlike subsistence movement, which needs both the original non-subsistence of the act of being and its subsistence in the singular. The act is totally indivisible by the form in its depth, this is why the form in turn participates in being and uh, its indivisibility. Point three, being and participation. Similar to Cornelio Fabro, participation is a central theme in the Thomistic exegesis of Gustav Sievert. Since act and subsistence present the primary two dyna dynamisms of being and its image character in relation to God, it is significant to add that both are related as being and essence are by mutual participation. Participation is rooted in act, while act remains perfectly at rest in itself. <clears throat> the most eminent way an individual being participates in the esse commune, which in turn is the archetypical disclosure of God, urbildlich geprägte Entäußerung. Quote, the actual participated being is not God, but being itself, whereby something is, end quote. 
This is why being, as Thomas states, according to Sievert, participates in the common ground of being by inflow, influx of higher being, per participationem a primo agente. Quote, to participate in being, therefore, always remains, sorry, always means firstly, to have a part of the communicable act. Secondly, to have in its part the whole of the act, namely being itself. And thirdly, to have God as a part in being itself, end quote. This participation implies that the creature enjoys a certain similarity with its creator. Here, Sievert elaborates his famous concept of the similitude of God, gleichness Gottes. Being is the foundation for a creator-creature relationship. Being, taken as one in its most common nature, as a commune on the one hand, and an individuated being in its particularity, i.e. its unification of act, of being and essence on the other, are both in their own right image of God in his absolutely simple ground of being, his pure simplicity, that as creator has some relation to the manifoldness of creation. So the modal contraction of the act of being can be best understood in its fluidity, which flows forth from its unity into a multiplicity. It moves and unfolds while never forfeiting its unity. Sievert points to two essential elements of participation. First, participation relates to the potentiality of created essence, which participates in the actus purus of God. In this sense, creaturely imperfection strives to divine perfection, since God is the ultimate actus, which is participatable. Here roots the potency character of essence. Secondly, in being and the hierarchical structure of created essence, created being, created common being, and finally uncreated being, the line of participation terminates with God and with him alone. God further does not participate in anything else, lest he would be determined by something outside of himself, outside of being, which is impossible, since there's only nothing outside of being. Quote, the being of things does not partake, but things partake by their being. End quote. Being itself does not participate in anything else, but it is the most inward divestiture in which the life of God is communicated. Conclusion. <clears throat> Sievert's rich, profound, and complicated metaphysical speculation presents us with more than one historical implication and fruitful application, in my opinion. Number one, any metaphysics, and most specifically to mystic metaphysics, does not elaborate a proper understanding of act, then this will lead to profoundly problematic repercussion. It is the nature of act to be in relation to something else. To be in relation is to be an act, if you will. Thus, if the grounding mediation, the gründende Vermittlung, is displaced or misunderstood, then multiplicity loses its ground and its unifying principle, ultimately God. If that is the case, an easy stand-in for the grounding ground will be a new ground, and in the case of a rational animal, that is man, it will become reason itself. Reason is thus displaced and reintroduced as the ontological ground of being and substitute for the cause of being. So the whole development of modern philosophy can be seen in this slide of hand. Point number two. If a rich image character of created being and uncreated being is not based on a profound understanding of the ontological consistency of the thing in itself, then surrogates for this image character will seep in. This means if the creature is only understood in terms of the real distinction, that is the distinction of S and essentia, the philosopher will have a hard time finding an ultimate unifying principle that makes the creator shine forth in the creature as unity since in God, S and essentia are not really distinct. In fact, they're not distinct at all. It is then natural to introduce another unifying concept, such as a un univocal understanding of being itself, which subsequently is distinguished in different modes into uncreated and created being, as in the case with John Donne Scotus' philosophy. Sievert comments on this development and criticizes this temptation sharply and repeatedly. Third point. Sievert detects in the history of philosophy what he calls a progressive empowerment as a result of the speculative movement into the divine ground. Quote, 
in such a way the streams of modern thoughts, thought branching out into many arms by virtue of the continuing identity of the non-identical flows with a certain necessity into that speculative melting sea of all differences as with the absolute science in Hegel of spirit interpreting itself. In other words, the real distinction will be rooted in God himself as absolute idealism proposes it. God becomes the victim of the dialectical division of S and Essentia. So the thinking substance, imagine here a Cartesian thinking substance, is always in danger of predicating its own ontological deficiency onto a perfect being. It then goes on resolving that ontological deficiency of the perfect being, which is now tainted by imperfection, with some kind of rational argument. As thought conceives, conceived of positing its own object in Descartes and Kant, God himself will now become an object of thought and in turn will be discarded as product of human imagination. Conclusively, we want to add Sievert's answer to the question, what are the limits of human reason? Because if reason is a gift of being, then the question about the limit of reason implies the question of the limit of created being. I'm running out of time here. So I'm just gonna give you the, not the problem, but only the solution. So what are the limits of reason? Sievert's proposition is this. If, and this is gonna be complicated because he is going all Heidegger. If the being, sein, of beings, seiendes, would be understood as an all-gathering clearing, Lichtung, as Sievert says happens in Thomas, then the base character of the difference would be disclosed. So the unity of being could then be understood as more primary than the difference. Unity would triumph over difference. And this would answer the question about the limit of reason. Finite being, so for endlich design, can only grasp being infinitude. In order to grasp the limitless of, limitlessness of being, limitless being must approach limited being. So said simply, the only way that the transcendence of being, sein, can be safeguarded against the penetrating investigation of finite being is that being reveals itself to being capital B to lower B, meaning that God reveals himself to creation out of his own volition. Thank you. Grazie, caro Jan. 